Okay, everybody, come on in. Welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you here. And I'm just getting this going live on Facebook so that we can make sure that anybody who didn't get registered can enjoy this fun with us. Um, all right, that is going. You should get that notification. Please feel free to drop in the chat where you are coming from. And to all of our Canadians today, I'm super excited to let you know that Michelle is a Canadian publisher. So uh, you are going to finally have somebody who speaks Canadian to you. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, all right. So let us know where you're coming from. And for fun, if you want, look at, look at all our Canadians are jumping at all of our Canadians, two of them. We, <laughs> But I would also like to know, we're here today to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities, but maybe you can drop in a challenge or two that you've been facing as, um, as you are learning all the ropes of publishing. All right, so we've got everybody popping in here. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. I'm going to introduce our guests, read our bios, and um, and then we will get into kind of a just a we we've we've mentioned this as like a fireside chat. We just kind of want to have a discussion around this topic um, to kind of lay the 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 outlook for you on what's happening in the publishing world. We've got voices here representing self-publishing, traditional publishing, and partnership publishing or hybrid publishing. You may be more familiar with that term. So we're just going to have a discussion around that and see where the conversation goes. There is a Q&A box. Please use that for any questions that you will have for us um, so that we can make sure that those don't get missed in the in the arena and of course michelle and angela at any point in time if you want to drop um your contact information your publisher information all of that stuff please do that make sure you select that it goes to everybody not just the panelists and hosts all right i'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to our guests we have angela engel who has become a dear friend of mine over the past few years she's been a speaker at our conference almost every year now at the Women in Publishing Summit. I think she wasn't at the first one, but she's been here every year since then. You may remember her from last year with her opening fireside chat with Brooke Warner that was a lot of fun, but she is also the owner and CEO of the Collective Book Studio. She wanted to build a different kind of publishing business, one that adhered to the author's vision every step of the way. Her experience in traditional publishing allows her to introduce beautiful books into the world, and she brings her passion for reading and sharing new ideas ideas into every project she undertakes. She grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, now calls Oakland, California home. For many years, she worked in sales and marketing for nationally known category leaders in publishing, including Chronicle Books, 10 Speed Press, Cameron and Company, Dwell Studio, and Moleskine. She's sold uh, to key national and international retailers such as Amazon, Costco, Nordstrom, and Target, and has become a sought-after expert in the industry. And she's also got a publishing deal with Simon & Schuster for distribution, which is absolutely incredible. And we have Michelle Halkett. I hope I just pronounced that correctly. Is that okay? Michelle is the publisher of Central Avenue, a traditional press of poetry and fiction. Yay to all of our poets in the group. Um, she is a techno and bibliophile with an education and career in economic and market research. Now that she's been running this press for the past 15 years and happy anniversary on that, that's a big anniversary. She finds herself fully immersed in words, paper stock and devices. When she isn't working, you'll find her practicing yoga, drinking too much coffee and roaming the forests of Vancouver, BC with her dog. And for those of you who are brand new, maybe this is the first event that you've seen or stumbled upon us. Um, I'm Alexa Bigwarf. I'm host of the Women in Publishing Summit. Um, I'm also the founder and CEO of Write, Publish, Sell. I have two hybrid presses, Cat Biggie Press and Purple Butterfly Press, and years of experience working with self-publishing authors uh, through the self-publishing process. I love, love, love being a connector of authors to the tools and services and people that they need to move forward in their journey 
providing education, training, publishing, um, knowledge on the publishing process across the board through all the ways, and of course, building community. And we do that primarily through the Women in Publishing Summit. We focus on publishing books that meet industry standards, no matter what route you're going, helping authors build their platforms, um, connecting with the people that you need, and, um, and book marketing is where I really, really enjoy spending my time and energies because what's the point of of having a book if nobody knows where and how to buy it. So welcome today. We are super excited to have you here with us. Thank you, Angela and Michelle, for being a part of this and having this conversation. And um, really quickly, as we get started, you know, we read your bios, gave the slight overview, but what do you want people to know about you, your company, who you work with? Michelle, I'll start with you. Sure. So um, let's see, yes. um, I run Central Avenue Press This or Publishing. This is my uh, company. Um, we publish uh, poetry and fiction. Um, for poetry, we primarily seek out uh, young voices that share their work on social media. And our fiction is in selected genres and upmarket character driven um, and we're agented only for fiction, but on the poetry side, we hold open submissions where anyone can can uh, submit. Um, we're also distributed by Simon and Schuster, so Angela and I are are siblings there. Um, and I'm not sure what else to tell you. That's sort of me in a nutshell. Well, we will, I'm sure, find out more as we go through. Angela, drop your website in the chat, yes. Michelle. Drop, drop your website, your website okay. so folks can see it. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm Angela Engel. I thank you. I had so much fun last year with Brooke Warner, and I'm now going to have so much fun with you, Alexa and Michelle. So, <laughs> but um, I actually, I just put my publishing house in in the chat. We have grown to about. 25 to 30 titles per year 30 SKUs because we do like uh special like journals and sidelines so I say we publish about 30 SKUs a year um we really emphasize in children's nonfiction and lifestyle and gift cooking um visual that is our uh bread and butter uh over here um we come from the what I think is some of the best west coast uh publishing um, most of my, all of my call, uh, staff, we come from either Weldon Owen or 10 Speed or Chronicle Books. Um, we've worked at some of the big houses as well as the big five. All of us have traditional background um, and custom publishing within the, that sphere, um, which has been going on since I was in publishing over 25 plus years ago. And so basically I founded this company um, now we're going into year five um, with the concept that what we do for brands, what we do for, like I worked on Splenda's cookbook, Top Chef cookbook, like big cookbooks, what uh, that myth of like how to pay to play into the traditional world. I just sort of said, hey, what this, if you're a content creator, why don't we give access or these kinds of contracts um, through like just talk about them to everybody and give uh, people a, a different avenue outside of the self-publishing or even a, a hybrid service or a hybrid uh, company that um, maybe does their own distribution. I was very always, since I set off the, um, my company, I never launched a list without traditional distribution. That was really, because that's what I come from. I come from more of that traditional distribution world. That's my background. And I would say, and perhaps you can um, chime in on what that traditional distribution means for all of our audience who have never, sure. for especially the types of books that you do, the cookbooks, the children's picture books, the beautifully designed books, like they just, it's hard, if not impossible <laughs> to do them well through the self-publishing channels. So what is traditional distribution? Yeah, so um, traditional distribution means that I have, um, I, I print offset, so I, I, I don't do POD. Now, there is backlist and there's a way to do POD. I know, Michelle, you might have a couple and we can kind of go into that. But the but, but the more majority of uh, the bread and butter for any traditional publisher, which is right, Michelle, which is yours that are not full color or myself, 
It's that we offset, we create uh, print runs, we have a warehouse and we have a sales team that's calling on these locations that we're not just um, listed in like a, a Ingram catalog or available to order after 12 weeks or a bookstore could get it. No, we have active reps going out and selling uh, to bookstores, but also to non-traditional markets. That's really important for a line like we do um, into anthropology, into Williams-Sonoma, into your mom and pop little gift store down the street. I mean, I, today my conversation was about hospital gift shops, like really focusing on the niche market. And so when I have Simon & Schuster, you know, we're also just uh, shown at all the, all the trade shows and the gift shows and stuff like that. So that is what traditional distribution is. And really for us, a print run it's very rare that's under 3000 really truly i have to kind of confident in confidence like okay out the gate can i print 4000 copies of this book if i can't print 4000 copies and feel that i can sell them this is not we we wouldn't take that project on now there's no crystal ball as we all know you know the market is volatile but that is sort of our guideline uh for, for and i don't know what michelle's is but that is our guideline here on full color work it's we really need to have feel confident in about four thousand copies michelle do you want to add anything on that on your company and basically what sure <laughs> yeah so traditional distribution, I mean, you can have distribution in different ways. So if you're a self-published author, or if you are a small press, your distribution would be through, let's say, KDP or Ingram Spark, um, who then feed the data of your book into the virtual catalogs that are mostly held by Ingram. Uh, Ingram is kind of the, 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 the entity that, that distributes all that data to the world so that your book can be ordered by them. But there is no team that's actively selling your titles into trade or, or non-trade channels like Angela was talking about. When you move to traditional distribution, you're now working with a company that has a sales force, a warehouse, um, they handle all the logistics, they'll help you with marketing. There's a whole thing, of, a whole team of people that you pay for <laughs> um, as a percentage of your sales. Now, there are um, companies that do their own distribution. So they don't have a traditional distributor uh, outside of their own company. They're doing that internally. And there's all different levels of presses that are doing this from sort of the medium size all the way up to the big five. I mean, they don't have a distributing a distribution company that's handling their their work they do that all in-house but it's the same sort of mechanism where they're they're actively sell they have reps they have warehouses all that kind of thing um you know like when i first got started i fell into that first uh bucket that i talked about so i was using print on demand i was trying to get you know my books by myself <laughs> into stores or the authors were doing it, you know, via consignment or something like that. And for years I was trying to get traditional distribution and like authors try to get a publisher, publishers try to get a distributor. <laughs> and so um, for me that happened, I started in uh, 08 and it wasn't until 2015 that I ended up getting traditional distribution because honestly you need to get to a certain size for a distributor to, to take you on. So, um, yeah, so I may be jumping ahead to the next question about how we, how we got started in this business, but. It's fine. We're going to go where this conversation takes us because it's really interesting. And I think, um, it's, it's important to, to, to say to the authors, we have a lot of people who are going to go the self-publishing route or work with the self-publishing assist or work with um, even hybrid presses. And distribution is one of those things that it's hard to wrap your head around. There's a lot of, of different things that happen at different levels. And, you know, I, I would say that one of the the biggest benefits of going with a traditional publisher or a hybrid press or publishing partner like Angela's with this kind of um, extended district with, with the traditional distribution, that is one of the biggest benefits of, of, of going through that route because those books get into channels that the print on demand roads just don't let them go to. And it's kind of interesting because this whole 
this whole idea for this webinar was born out of a similar conversation that Angela and I were having, because as a small hybrid publisher for a children's book publishing company, I have distribution, but it's not distribution like Angela or yours through Simon & Schuster. It's through a small distributor. Um, they have a buyer, but there's no sales reps. So even at that level, even with traditional distribution, our books get into sales catalogs that they wouldn't get into through um, the self-publishing or print-on-demand model, but I don't have active sales reps getting out there. So as you can see, just from listening to this conversation, like there's there's a lot of pieces, uh, which is part of our topic today, the challenges in the publishing world in 2024 is figuring out which route you're going, which type of company you're working with, and how you know how you you will be moving forward in there and what your job as the author is, no matter which route that goes to. So, you know, just keeping a lot of this may sound like Russian to you because it's a lot of words and terms that even after years in this industry, I'm still like, now, wait a minute, how does all this go together? So it's okay <laughs> if, it, you know, if you have questions about all of those things, but we're going to move into talking about what those big challenges are for authors across the board, what the opportunities are, and how we can make the best of it, no matter which route we wind up in. So briefly, if you all will tell us how you got started, and then we'll start talking about the biggest challenges you've seen and opportunities. Uh, Angela, why don't you go first this time? Well, I answered an ad when I was <laughs> right out of college. Uh, I'm a comparative lit and creative writer degree, actually, which I've never written my own book, um, which one day maybe I will. Uh, I started right out of college. So I was, what, 22 years old when you graduate University of Oregon. And um, I was coming, I came down to the Bay Area. That's where like my roommates had li had lived. And I was like, I want to live in San Francisco. And so I answered an ad uh, at Publishers Group West, which is now part of Ingram, which was owned at the time by Charlie Witten. And this is over 25 years ago. And um, I became a marketing assistant. And I literally was like Xeroxing tip sheets and doing whatever. And print on demand, Lightning Source was like, what is this? And there was like a year after I started there, there was a young woman, young person, young woman, um, who I'm still friends to her with this day. She's no longer in publishing. She had a tech degree at UC Santa Barbara and came in a year younger than me and was like, this was telling everyone print on demand and lightning source. We all and Amazon, we have to listen to this. And everyone was like, ah, no way. And she was really right. And she started sort of some of that over there at Ingram. And so um, I just grew up in the industry and I quickly, uh, people gave me, I grew up really fast in the industry in my early twenties. I had already, uh, you know, started selling to Costco. I, I wrote a letter to 10 speed press after writing, what color is your parachute? I think I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, when Chronicle books had actually, I got headhunted to go work for Chronicle books. Um, and I had a great job there. Um, four plus years in Bass Market. And um, I took off moleskin, those journals and, you know, talked about, you know, leading that um, into uh, stationary, into Target. Um, and it really just, I sort of grew. And, um, and I think to succeed for me was always to be agile, to be open, to have that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and so I sort of think starting my own company had a lot to do with that. I'm a mom of three kids and I wanted to think about my career differently. I wanted to think about my flexibility differently. I feel I work harder now than I ever thought I would, but I still get to do it in my terms as I own the company. So that's been, that was sort of my, uh, and it's risk, right? I mean, this is not for, these are low margins. You do it for the love. And I have to remind authors this all the time. Like, like what is your why on this book right and so rights or giving up some of like the say in your cover like i'm partnership i don't meaning there are parts of my contract that actually say i have control of certain aspects of your book and for some people that's not what they want to do now my contract is very is, i have a term it's it's more like what i would say a foreign rights contract so 
10 to 15 years and like more like what sub rights agents do. Um, so it's a very different than owning the rights for lifetime. So I am not traditional in that way. We run Kickstarters. We do all kinds of create creativity, how you buy in. Do you own the art? Like we do a lot of different ways. Do you own the photography? I don't take movie rights. So I'm much, much, much more flexible than a traditional contract. At the end of the day though, um, there are, there are certain guidelines that I have to adhere to because I'm in the traditional space, right? I, I and it is what Simon Schuster is expecting of me, but it's not just Simon and Schuster. It's what school library journal is, library journal, book list, publishers weekly, my colleagues, my, you know, that's what they're expecting of us because my goal is like, our books are on the shelf, just like Harper Collins kids just like Scholastic, right? We work with Literati, for example. They, I, they've they taken a couple of our, four of our titles. Like we um, we are working with uh, PJ Library. Like we definitely need to be seen just as as any other, lar as one of the big five. And, and, and also honestly, as the strong indies are, Andrews McMeal, Abrams, Gib Smith, Sourcebooks, you know, competing with these strong independent publishers as well. Great. Does that helped. That gave everyone a background of yes. like what I do and why I do it, I guess. You know, it's before Michelle says, it's so interesting to me. And this is why I love to, even in a, a community that is a lot of people who probably will self-publish or go with hybrid presses, like I always find it very, very important for people to have an understanding of the big picture of all the things that are happening behind the scenes. And I love having conversations with you because being uh, uh, understanding what's happening in the traditional world can sh really shed a lot of light for all, all authors and publishers, no matter which route they're going. So I, I love hearing this, the, you know, the backside of that and all the different things happening. So, okay. Michelle, how did you get started? Yeah. So I'm very different from a lot of people in publishing in that I did not spend my career in it. I actually spent it in market research. And then round about 2008, I think I had a midlife crisis and uh, I am not a writer, but I was like, I'm going to help people get their work out into the world. And and uh, I was going to do it via this very little known thing called ebooks. Um, and so at the time, the ebook market was quite fractured. It wasn't very well known. And uh, I was a little bit of a DIY kind of thing. I don't know if you heard of smash books. That was, I don't know if they're still around, but at the time, that was kind of what they were doing. Um, and what it enabled me to do was to take on a bunch of books and make a whole lot of mistakes because I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, but before ebooks really took off, the, you know, the first time things went viral, it was because of book bloggers. And we were publishing in um, a couple of genres like YA paranormal that bloggers got onto. And, you know, there was a couple of books that really did well. When ebooks started taking off in the early 2010s, that gave me this nice kind of stable platform to then go more into, into traditional and print publishing. So I mentioned that I was doing that via POD and uh, Lightning Source, um, which is now Ingram Spark. And for a few years, I spent that time trying to find a traditional distributor because getting books into stores was near impossible. Um, I was maybe one of those outliers where I had Barnes and Noble take notice of a book that we had published that was taking off and say, do you want to list it at Barnes and Noble? I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so um, things just sort of, you know, snowballed and I ended up working with a, a smaller distribution company called IPG. Um, they're a great option for small to medium sized publishers. Um, and then, you know, ever, basically, once you get traditional distribution, if you thought you were doing well before, it's like a quantum leap into a, a whole nother level of publishing. Um, so and yeah, so now um, I'm with Simon and Schuster. That's awesome. I think, um, yeah. I think to 
tackle opportunities here. I think just hearing your stories and how you've both come up in this industry and taken very different routes. And for me, I started with no intention of ever being a publisher, but just wrote my own book for grieving mothers, wrote and self-published and found that I really enjoyed the process and wanted to, as other people started asking me, how did you do this? How I started teaching myself all the skills, learning everything that I could and kind of grew up grew my company around providing um, authors the information that I was learning as I did it. But uh, so the the cool thing about opportunities is this industry is constantly growing and booming and, and, and things are happening. And if you're willing to jump in there and learn how to market your book better or how to figure out which, which type of distribution or how, which publisher to work with or what routes you need to go, like there are just, there are so many opportunities in there. But the challenges are going to be what what determine whether you can get there or not, I think. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the book bloggers, because around the same time you were setting up was I was a few years behind you. But I started off blogging about other books, too, and was on lots of book tours. There was a um, now um, a lot of people know Melissa Storm Smith or Melissa Storm. Um, and she at the time had a company called Novel Publicity and they would do these great um, blog blogger campaigns where they'd send you the book and some swag and all kinds of stuff and you'd blog about it. So it's fun to hear that that was a part of your process too. I remember being a part of that and thinking how cool was it that I could get free books and promote them by by you know publishing some blog posts and doing that. And these days that has transformed into bookstagrammers and TikTok. And if y'all don't think that these people have influence, you need to do your research on what's happening on TikTok and has been happening the last year or two where big stores are actually shelving their content in their stores with what's being talked about on TikTok by these by these influencers who are telling everybody what, what book to go read. That's a whole different conversation on marketing, but it brings up the topic of challenges. Like no matter what route you go, I think the three of us would all be in agreement here that whether you're working with a company like Angela's or Michelle's or self-publishing or anything, I think one of the biggest challenges out there is book marketing. And part of that is the fact that um, that a lot of authors have this idea, and you two can tell me whether this is you agree with or disagree, but a lot of people think, oh, well, I'll just go with a traditional publisher or a hybrid publisher, and I don't have to worry about marketing. Do you agree? Do you disagree? What is what, what are your thoughts around these, that topic, that idea, that statement, <laughs> whatever you want to call it? Angela. Well, I can start if you oh, yeah, like. you start, oh, no. you start, Michelle. Okay. So from the traditional side, I don't know if everyone knows the difference between traditional and hybrid and, and that kind of thing. But on the traditional side, um, the author does not pay anything to the publisher. So that's the, the, the publisher is responsible for all costs, including editing, design, uh, distribution, uh, name it, that's what we take on. So when it comes to marketing, um, we have to be, you know, we are spending money on marketing, but we have to be very careful about how we're, how we're spending that money. And that money gets, um, you know, spent in different ways, depending on the book and depending on the author. When I, I'm actually in the process of, um, of, of going through a whole bunch of poetry submissions and deciding who to take on. And one of the biggest things that we look at is author platform. Now, platform means different things in different genres. So we work primarily with a lot of social media poets, for lack of a better word. So these are young people who share their work on social media. Does that mean you need to have half a million followers on Instagram in order to get picked up? No. It does mean that could be part of your platform, but it also could mean that you work you know, in your local community or in the, or you've got strong ties to the literary community at large um, to help, you know, boost your visibility up. Um, and so when we're looking to take on people, yes, we definitely look at their platform because getting visibility is very difficult. And that's the first thing that a Barnes and Noble or a Target or something will say is, well, who is this person and why, how are they going to help drive sales into their store? So, 
you can't as an author think that you can, you know, just write away in this attic on a typewriter, like, like in the olden days, it is about putting yourself out there. And the most successful authors that are that are out there are ones that do that, you will always have the outliers, who are these recluses who can just type away. But that is pretty rare. Um, and, you know, talking about challenges, I would say that one of the struggles that I think traditional authors or presses have is that a lot of authors figure they may as well just do it themselves because they, they do have an entrepreneurial spirit and they think that they can, you know, if they have to partner with a publisher, then, well, they may as well just do it themselves and keep more of the margin. So that is a question and a challenge that I've been faced with quite a bit over the last few months is that. I've made offers, I've made traditional offers to people and they've gone, no, nah, I'll do it myself. Now, like Angela was saying, they don't understand that, you know, with limited distribution on the self side, it, they're not going to get the same visibility, but they might be fine with that because that's their personality. Um, so yeah, like as a traditional press, I'm looking for an author that not only knows how to write a great book, but also know, knows and wants to put themselves out there because, you know, we're not all extroverts and being for an introverted person to go and stand in a bookstore or at a big show like Angela was talking about, like the, the big conferences, um, that's really challenging for some people. So you kind of have to know that about yourself too. Anyway, I might be getting off topic and I'll let you, I'll let you no, chat. Fine. Angela. I want about... you to share whatever you want to share. And, you know, really yeah. quickly on the, on the self-publishing side, like I, I, I've seen some comments about what well, I was able to get my book to number one as a, as a self-published author. And we are by no means saying that self-published authors can't have the same level of success. I work with self-published authors all the time who are killing it. I think the thing to take away from this is not that we're saying one route is better than the other. We're saying no. there are doors that are opened through different yeah. routes that, um, you yeah. know, if you want your book in an airport. That's and, almost impossible to do as a self-published author. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is that there are, so we have, we have ways into channels that self-published authors don't have. Right. But Self-published authors have ways into Amazon that we don't have because right. the Amazon algorithm loves self-published authors because they're double dipping, right? They're making the money on the print side. And so they're like, okay, well, we'll just promote this book. Even the algorithm promotes the book and it lets it float to the top. And we see this as, because I've taken on previously self-published books and they generally do well. Like, so if they've sold 10,000 uh, self-published, they'll sell 50,000 traditionally published. Wow. That said, um, the Amazon algorithm doesn't seem to like the book quite as much <laughs> once it becomes traditionally published. So, you know, knowing these things as a self-published author, you can ride that algorithm, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. But you yeah. also, to that point, though, you have to be willing to do the work. You have yes. to be putting a book, a self-published book on Amazon isn't going to get you there. You have to no. be growing your platform. You have to be doing these things. You have to be writing more books. You have to be doing all of the things to make sure that you are continuing to find readers. Okay, Angela, yeah. you are hugging that book so I tight. am. I'm hugging this book <laughs> because this just got into the New York Times. Go pick it up today. Oh. It's in print. I have to run out after this and find my New York Times. So- <laughs> I want to talk about two things we've talked about. I do not publish black and white print on like things that Amazon can do easily. So when I, I saw a different Avenue. So I saw, I come from this traditional world, right? And, but yet Chronicle books, like I said, we do custom, we create deals, buybacks. They're in contracts, right? Like, okay, we sign this deal. The author has to buy back 5,000 copies, right? Like, I, so I sort of was like, you guys, an advance is on royalties and they're having to buy all these books. Like, what if I just said to a content creator, how about if I give you a royalty between 20% and 50? I know there's other hybrids who give a lot more. We cannot. The cost to go into traditional distribution, I'm just like, that's like, I'm like, nope, we're not the right person for you, right? So, but we give a lot higher royalties, but that, that also means what are you paying into? That said, why I'm holding this up, this is in the New York Times in Florence Fabricant's column 
because it's a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous book. It reminds me a little bit of how Nam Nam Nam, Nam Paleo Andrews laid it out. But but the reason is is that the New York Times knows that it that it can the consumer can buy it everywhere at Books a Million, at Barnes and Noble, in store, right at Kitchen Arts and Letter at lectures at uh, Book Lauder. Just did, if anyone's from Seattle, Book Larder, like just did a stack yesterday on its book birthday. Congratulations to Taste of the World. We're doing a, they're coming to the Bay Area Book Festival. If you are in the Bay Area, come. Rowena, the author, is going to be talking on a food panel on creating food in June. Like this is exactly the channels. What I'm saying is because also mainstream media needs to make sure when they're writing about the book, the book the consumer can go buy it, right? So there are certain parts of when I thought about how do I want to launch a business? I want to flip the switch on how to, you don't need an agent, for example. Uh, people I see all in the chat and it's questions about agents. For me, you don't need an agent. Now we only take less than 5% of our submissions, but I say submit, try it. Tell me your platform. Are you going to run a Kickstarter? Do we like the photography? What are you willing to invest? Like, um, again, it's somewhat of a platform, but you don't necessarily need to have that traditional Instagram or TikTok platform. What is your LinkedIn platform? Mm -hmm. What is your email list serve? We look at it very, very differently. Um, and often authors are really, um, I they're the best for me because in many ways, they know they're going to make these higher royalties. So like I have an author right now. I did a border story, a beautiful Mexican border story. He emailed me and he goes, I want to take out a little table in this like Arizona book festival. And I'm like, great, I'll send you some books. He's there going to make greater royalties. He's got, so he, he has his own table there. Right. And I just, you know, the partnership makes it easier for both of us on the ground. He knows if I take out this table, what is 25% royalty off of a retail when I sell it? It's it's like a win-win for both of us, right? And so that's sort of the model that I've try I'm trying to create and break down some barriers. Um, that said, it still takes time. We we typically, I don't know, Michelle, what you try to tell authors, but right now we definitely it's very rare for us to be able to do a book within less than 15 months. It's just really like, so, so right now I'm acquiring pretty much for summer of 2025 and fall of 2025. I, and I, you know, that's just the reality too. Some people want their books done faster and we can't, we can't. Yeah. It's yeah. That's, I think that's worth noting that traditional publishing is definitely slower. Um, and that's because you have to get into the sales cycle. So we're presenting, Angela and I are presenting our fall titles to the staff at Simon and Schuster now. So and that's because they're going out now six or seven or eight months ahead of time to the stores to say here's what you should be listing for the Christmas or the fall season. Um, I acquire a little I mean I'm look I can work on a shorter time because I can I print mostly black and white and I print in North America. So I don't have to account for the long times in transit across the ocean for the most part. And if you're printing color, you have to go to Asia because it's very, very expensive. Um, so that's a challenge, Angela, that you're facing that when I you know, publish a book, I can print it in the U.S. because it's yeah. black and white and it's pretty you know, reasonably priced. But color, yeah, you have to work with a longer lead time because... And you're also doing very um, specific things like board books and cutouts and things that you just can't do in North America quite as easily. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because I had two pretty revolutionary uh, experiences. And this is another reason why I am such a huge proponent of all authors investing the time and the money to go to trade events when you can, no matter how you, no matter how you're publishing, it's it, seeing what's happening in the industry and what the competition is and what's, what's being put out there into the world is critical. So two years ago, I went to the Bologna book fair as a children's book publisher 
I knew that was the place to be as somebody who was interested in trying to see if we could do, do some foreign rights. And I worked with an agent for a short, for about a year. Um, and, you know, I did some of these things and then going to the, um, the ALA, the American Library Association um, conference in June in Chicago, where I saw Angela as well. And it was absolutely eye-opening to me when you see the books that are being produced and marketed by largely large publishing companies and agencies. When I saw Angela's books, oh my gosh, y'all, this one book she had at ALA, like it had the cover, the seeds, like it was like the grief book. Oh my gosh, it is so beautiful. Like things that you just, you cannot do these types of things. And even yeah. with your children's publish, you know, your children's picture books, Ingram Spark does fine quality on, on a picture book. I'm going to leave it at fine. It's good enough if you're selling your books through Amazon and you can sell them. And there's lots of people who have success there. And I'm not poo-pooing anyone going that route because that's the right route for many people. But when you hold that book in one hand and one that's been printed on these beautiful satin, like like you want to rub your face on the books. They're so pretty and nice. <laughs> quality. I, we just won that book. I'm going to find it just won two awards, Michelle, at Pub West. It oh. won small cover design and it also won for anthology and, and poetry, Michelle, actually your category. And so it was so interesting when I took it on, because I don't really publish poetry, Michelle, but I, but it was paired with this art. So it's this book, this woman who lost her sister, uh, it's called Morning Leaves, and we can put it in the chat, but she, she, uh, um, you know, starts to write poetry through nature. And so we really wanted to develop a book that had these gorgeous watercolor paintings on side. So she came to us through actually a friend of mine, um, the owner and CEO and president of, of Cork Books, they have distribution with Random House because they they like were like, we can't really do that. So we get a lot of referrals or contacts, mm -hmm. even within the traditional world, like Michelle May and I might give her a referral or Brooke, like people come to us because they know we're really good at color work. Don't forget, like my managing ed, Dean Burrell, is, was over at 20 years at Chronicle Books. He's made a lot of full color books. My production manager was Fred Weldon Owen and Chronicle Books, like our editor. So we um, really know, like even today I was on a call and the cover was not working right for us. And it was just because the shadow. So we know how to do the mission work and the Photoshop work to make our covers really pop in a way that it's just honestly, it's, it's, it, I say you can't train AI. You can't train people this way. This is just, it's an art form, like a, like a museum. It's a curation. Yeah. And I'd I, like know, to, Alexa, sorry, if you don't mind, I want to just pick up on what you said about trade shows. Yes. So I'll tell you three success stories about going to a trade show and just walking around. That's how I got traditional distribution. I had been trying for years to reach Ingram. And th at the time, there were several distributors out there. I went to Book Expo in 2015 with my little books in my purse. <laughs> and I just walked up to, to distributors and said, this is me. This is my book. They had gotten emails and pitches and all that from me before. And I walked out of that trade show with three out of four of the people I'd gone up to offering me distribution. Fast forward to 2018 and 2019, I'm back at Book Expo. I have two authors come up to me and say, this is me. This is my book that I self-published. What happened? I ended up taking them on. And this is out of hundreds and hundreds of submissions that, that we get. Yeah. Um, so I highly, highly recommend virtual things like this are awesome. And if, but if you ever get the chance, even if it's a local thing in your own town, I would love to go to Bologna and Frankfurt. I just don't have the cash right now to do that. But um, absolutely go to in-person things and talk to people. It's a and really, listen. It's a don't really just talk. good way <laughs> to make connections with people. I mean, when I went to yeah. Book of America in 2016, 
16 or 17, I think. That's where I met Brooke Warner in person. That's where I met Fazia Burke in person. That's where I met the team from Ingram Spark. Like even if you're, you don't have to be going for a traditional publisher to meet people that can be very influential in what you're doing, but you can meet publishers, you can meet agents, you can meet printers. There's lots of yeah. printers if you're looking for the printing option, all of those types of things. So it's, it's, it's an important part of your education. And I would say- yeah you know, moving along with, and I know we spent a lot of time on color and full picture books and things like that, because that's Angela's expertise. But that is a big challenge for people. If you have a specialty book or a book, I, I know even fiction authors who really want these beautiful, like hardcover books that have embossing and all those kinds of things. Like it's, it's quite challenging to do through, it's impossible to do through print on demand. So you have to be considering other ways to do it, whether you as an individual author are looking for a printer and distribution route, which is also completely doable, but hard because you have to learn everything in the world about publishing, or you can look for publishing partners, other companies. But I would say, you know, moving along with our, our challenges, like beyond this piece of it, which is the printing and distribution, which is a huge challenge for anybody who's trying to go with a specialty book for self-published authors print with a normal fiction or nonfiction book that doesn't require a lot of bells and whistles, Print on demand is a perfectly great option and your challenges come more through like really understanding the publishing side, the metadata, to make sure you're categorized properly, keywords that you're marketing, that all of those types of things. What are challenges that um, that you two have seen specifically in the last year that you see continuing to be a challenge into 2024 for authors across the board based on your knowledge in the publishing industry? Yeah, I would say the biggest challenge that hit us since the pandemic is the um, move from from bookstores away from frontlist to focusing on backlist. So mm -hmm. for those who don't know what that is, backlist is defined as a title that was published more than a year ago. Um, so in a time when things were in a state of flux and craziness, bookstores started relying on um, what was already working. And so we saw the backlist, generally as a traditional publisher, you're looking for your backlist to make up about 50% of your income, your front list is 30 to 35, and your subsidiary rights to be the remainder. Um, that 50% has now gone to like, I think it's approaching 70% for a lot of presses. And so what this means is that bookstores are less willing to take a risk and take a chance on front list titles. That means the book that you just wrote and you're trying to, to get out there. Um, as publishers, this that just goes down the line. So as publishers, we now have to look at what we're taking on in the front list and make sure that it's really, really got a, a good chance of getting into these stores who are less willing to take a chance on front list titles. Um, so that is a massive, massive problem. And I don't know what the stat is, something like a million books are published every year be, with all of the different types of publishing. So it's very, that's been a huge challenge, huge. Yeah, Angela? Oh, you're muted. Oh, she's on mute. I was trying to find my mute button. Um, what do I find challenging with authors? You know, I think it's access, right? Like I think often, like, I mean, I was really privileged. I didn't have to do what Michelle, you had to do with like your bags and like walking the trade show. I did not have traditional distribution. I literally was able to call Joe Matthews in owner of IPG because I'm an insider and go, and all my company was insiders, and we were supposed to be packaging. And so we were supposed to actually sell our books, like invest, sell the books. There's a whole nother, that's a totally different conversation on packaging. What I want, that's the challenge for authors. Our lists are limited, okay? Mm -hmm. Our lists are limited, even in the big guys, okay? And the reason is, is we're content creators ourselves. So, 60% of my list might be an author. 40% of my list, we're creating ourselves. Friday night cocktails that just got blown out. We sold 15,000 copies in anthropology, Williams-Sonoma, everybody bought it. That's us. 
we're writing the book, we're doing the photography, we're creating it. Now we're making an extension line, right? A deck, all this other stuff. Books that I'm doing for Literati, we're creating ourselves. So like, so, and that's National Geographic, that's Chronicle, that's a lot of houses. We, you know, work for hire, how you can just get that done, okay? Then, so imagine that. Then you got to figure out uh, on top of that, how many books they say now with self-publishing, there's like a million books a year being published. So the challenge for the authors, I think is still, there's too many books being published. Mm -hmm. There just is. Mm -hmm. So how is yours different? How is yours unique? How are you going to work with it? And also what I would try to say to the bet that everyone is how much time are you willing to give? So don't be too fast, especially in my world, because it's your product, the type of everybody's world, the typeset, the pri the running heads, the typos, like give yourself the time, right? Find yourself the time. You can't do a book in a month. You can barely write an essay for a college application in a month. Um, <laughs> so you can't write a book. Um, so give yourself the time, but also allow yourself like, is the traditional working? Is three years enough? Like, what is your platform? And so I think that that is the biggest challenge for authors. And that's what I think um, people really need to start to talk about more is like, yeah. what is access? Who has the access? How are we breaking it down? And, um, you know, how are we giving access to authors either if they need an agent Mm -hmm. Or if they need to get a hold of somebody like Michelle, you do a lot of things without agents. A lot. I think it's partly authors don't even know, creators don't even know about Central Avenue or about Milkweed Editions or about Rare Bird Lit. I mean, I could go on and on and give you, Alexa, probably like 50 tr small traditional publishing houses that I would highly recommend that you don't necessarily need an agent. Yeah. That have traditional yeah. distribution. I may come back to you for that list because I'm sure <laughs> everyone now see it's already starting. Tamian's like, I want that list. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, like I probably could. Like, you know, these are great uh independent houses that you don't need an agent for for poetry, for 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 children's books, uh, for sci-fi. I don't publish any sci-fi, but you know, I might I will I would look if people are in Southern Rare Bird Lit is great down in Southern California in LA. Yeah. Well, here's what I wanted I to, say. um, sorry, go, sorry, Alex. I just wanted to mention something that Alex or that, um, Angela just brought up and that is finding your space as an author. I'm worried we're going to run out of time. Um, yeah. but <laughs> one of the, I'm in control oh, of this. Good. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay. One of the things I just wanted to mention about finding your space is, um, find your intersection. And I think that that might be an easier way to, to identify yourself in this vast multitude of books being published and of readers as well. So um, don't just say I publish, um, you know, lifestyle. Where does your lifestyle, you know, writing or whatever it is intersect with something else? And so an example I'll give you is one of our poets, is a poet <laughs> and she wrote a book of poetry but she's also a tea lover and she goes to like all these tea events so her book was a combination of poetry paired and it had tea pairings in it so now when she goes to market herself she can identify tea loving poet readers poetry readers mm. that's super specific but when you go specific you also drive way higher engagement than you do if yeah. you're just trying to like throw something against the wall and see if it sticks. Absolutely. So I strongly advise any publisher or author out there to find their intersection. So for us on the poetry side, it is social media, or sorry, it is poetry and self-help. Mm -hmm. So because our poetry is very much like self-help, the two of them intersect in this very, very small space. And that's okay, because the ones who are at this intersection read so much of this poetry, and they buy it over and over again. 
That's such a great point. And it, and it really leads well into some of the challenges that I see too, working with, with this group of authors across the board from people who are self-publishing all the way through traditional. And I think there's a few challenges that, that I, I see um, that authors have got to spend the time to learn and grow and, and get better at. And the first one is exactly what you're talking about, understanding your niche, your genre, and how to find your readers and the people that are going to be the ones who will become your your fans that are going to continue to share those efforts and help you grow your platform and all of that. I think that the biggest challenges that I see right now is um, too many programs that are out there telling people you can write and publish your book in 90 days and do it for free. That makes me so angry. I could throw something at somebody yeah. because it's like, it's just, you can't, you, you can, let me just put it that way. It's true. It's not a lie that can happen. But to do all the things that we've been talking about, which largely come back to quality, whether you're printing, whether you're publishing with a, a traditional publisher or you're self-publishing, the quality of your book is the most important thing when it comes to how well your book is going to do long term. It has to be edited. It has to be formatted. You have to have a competitive cover. And you can only do these things if you're knowledgeable and aware of what's happening in your industry, in your genre, and all of those types of things. So I think that's a big challenge. And the solution to that is education. And you're all here at this. So you're interested in education and knowledge, but it's also community. And that's why the Women in Publishing Summit was born really is to bring people together so that we can have the Michelle's and the Angela's in the room with the Alexa's and the Tamians and the Karen's and and we can come together and meet people and talk to people and grow those relationships of people that you might work with so the second piece kind of ties into that and that's just a general lack of knowledge with it which impacts authors tremendously the number of times I've seen people um take a bad deal pay a lot of money for nothing that ever comes out of it. Um, sign up with somebody because they're getting like pressure sales for something, whether it's print, you know, whether it's the publishing or the marketing or any of those. So again, it comes back to really taking the time to learn if you're going to be an author, no matter how you're publishing, this is a business and it needs to be treated like a business and you need to behave as if you are, you know, being a business, learn marketing, learn platform, learn all of these types of things. So for me, that's that's what I'm most passionate about is the knowledge behind. I am not a proponent for one route over the other. I think, I, I don't remember whether it was Angela or Michelle that said at the very earlier on, you have to know what your why is, what you're trying to get there, your goals. And for some people, if you're doing a beautiful cookbook, I just would be hard pressed to tell anyone to self-publish a cookbook ever because of all the things that go into a beautiful book with lots of color and all those types of things. And I would say, go to Angela. And I've sent people to Angela that want to do cookbooks. So, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so on and so forth, but, you know, so education is power. I believe that was a slogan of the the eighties. The more, you know, all those things, you know, it's so true. Like the more, you know, the better decisions you can make, the more time you can put into it and do not let anybody tell you that you have to have your book published in six months or three weeks or 90 days or whatever. Do it right. That's my, that's my stool. Like my, uh, you know, thing that I will stand up and take, take the time to do it right so that you can be more successful in everything else. Um, okay. I know there's a bunch of questions here, Alexa, in the chat, which we might not even oh, be able to get to, but Michelle, Michelle, there was a question for you, which was on the website. It says a submission is after you've done by agent. Do you have any exceptions? Not on the fiction side, no. Um, and for poetry, it's <laughs> we announce it once a year on Instagram and TikTok. And you've got two weeks to, to send in your pitch. So last time we did that was in November. Um, and so we just got through all of those and, and made our second round um, picks out of the, you know, over 100 or whatever that came in. But that's my intersection is social media poetry and self-help kind of style of, of, of writing. Um, so that's where, you know, we, we advertise. So no, unfortunately you need to be agented on the fiction side and then on poetry. Yeah. The only opening we have is if you, if you happen to find us uh, on Instagram. 
Do you do teasers? Like we're about to announce. Do you do any teasers, Michelle? Only, only for newsletter subscribers. So if you subscribe oh. to the newsletter, then I'll say, hey, just so you know, we've got this coming up. The one thing that we do have open right now is we do an anthology. It's a poetry prize. Um, so for $25, you get up to five poems that you can submit. And it's a not-for-profit venture. Um, basically, the submission fee helps cover the printing and the editing and the production. Um, and yeah, the first edition is coming out in about a month and is amazing. I'm so proud of it. Um, so, and we happen to be open for that right now for about the next month. So if you want to dip your toe into the poetry publishing arena, doesn't need to be self helpy or social media, whatever. It's just pure, do we like your poem? Um, the winner gets, we pick one winner for 500 bucks and three runners up for $100. They get $100 each. And then there's about an, an additional 50 or so that get selected to go in the book and they get an honorarium. Um, and honestly, I ended up like one of those ones that made it to the second round was one that we um, that submitted to the poetry prize. So there's no guarantees, but it is a way in the door. Oh, interesting. You should put the link yeah. in. You guys, yeah. I am, a, I have to admit, I'm very, very, very like, I mean, my very like the specialty kind of shops. I like, I love, I smell paper. I like paper. Michelle's poetry books, when you see them, her covers, I mean, right away, instantly, Michelle, when I, I only have known you ever to have distribution. So when I went, even though we published very different genres, I still want to go back to um, the why a book. I read a book I highly recommend in college. So it was called, uh, I hope it's still in print, um, Alberto Manguel, he's an Argentinian writer, and it's called The History of Reading. And he talks about in this moment um, where he's in a coffee shop and he has a book that he's reading and he spills coffee on the book. And then he, cause he saw this girl, he's like, oh my God, I love that, that girl, you know? And so, and then the book becomes not just about the story, but that moment he fell in love with this girl in this coffee shop and falling in it. And what I, why am I bringing that up? It's that's the book that you want to treasure that you keep on that shelf and no matter what. And so Michelle, I wanted to say that even though I publish these, like, yes, I want them on my shelf. I found them in a specialty shop or at Barnes and Noble on this gift table. I think that actually stays true to other genres, right? I think Alexa, you talked about this too. And I think that that's what uh, traditional publishing is all about. I mean, Michelle, you're competing with like an Andrews McMeal. You're competing with a large publishing house. So you have to make sure yours also can kind of jump off that. Re they have to work for retail. It's very different to work for retail than it is to work for an online platform. It is very, very different. That's such a good point. Such a good point. Yeah. You know, um, we've, we've, there's one question I want to make sure we, that Wendy asked um, about, she says she's editing an anthology of poetry. You mentioned um, Angela A or someone mentioned an award for poetry anthologies that was that was um Dropped michelle it. was okay. oh Perfect. no um yeah so pub west which michelle and i are both on the board there they do a design award every year and um there is a category for anthologies and poetry and what they're really looking for because i serve on that committee when you so make sure that you know, what's your typography like? Your header's like, like poetry is really interesting in how you play with typography with the words. I think, Michelle, you can kind of talk about that more. But like, so from a design perspective, if you're going to apply for an award, you really feel like, oh my God, I've done, like, I remember when Chronicle won one year for a, a poetry book. Um, you know, they're doing something a little interesting, even if it's not with illustrations like I did, but the, within that, the book and design. So that one, and I think also IBPA and Indie uh, Forward Magazine, uh, Indies, they also have an, a poetry uh, that you can apply for. Uh, Michelle, do you know any other poetry anthology awards? I, I know Indies Forward Magazine has one. I know IBPA yeah. has one, which is yeah. the Benjamin Franklin's um, Pub West. And I, I, I'm sure there's like short fiction and all those other stuff. Um, and sometimes you should look at um, 
So there are certain regional, like California has its own region and they have a Poppies Award for the California. So if you're a poet within California, you have to be, um, have written the book in California or about California, you can apply for those awards. They have that for Colorado. I think they, I don't know what they have in Canada, but they have yeah. stuff that, and you should definitely look in um, into your own regional uh, awards. Yeah. I guess the only thing I would advise against awards is that there are a ton of what I like to call pay for or profit oh. awards. And mm -hmm. you can usually tell what they are because there's about 500 categories <laughs> and they're expensive to enter. Like sometimes they're like two or $300 to enter. And so I forward Indies, the Benjamin Franklin's, those are a little better, I think, but save your money. They, they won't do anything for your book. That, um, so you'd be better off taking that $200 and buying Amazon um, marketing services, like, like at keywords or whatever. Um, so, and, and that kind of brings me into the point that I want to bring up for both publishers and authors, and that's to grow organically. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've just seen so many publishers and self-published authors come and go, and it's because they spend too much money too fast. Mm -hmm. So if you're self-publishing, you're probably doing it because you're an entrepreneurial person and you like doing things yourself. And that gives you that, that high. So do things yourself. Don't pay for someone to do something that you can learn to do on your own, like manage own Amazon ads or something else that you could learn to do. Sure, you'll make mistakes, but that is way cheaper than hiring someone and paying them thousands of dollars to do something that you could have learned to do on yourself. Yep. And once you get a little bit of income coming in, then you can look at adding on people or tools or services that will help you. But I think the biggest mistake you can make is going out and paying someone to do something that you can do on your own. Editing? No, you can't do that on your own. Thank you. I was about <laughs> to say, wait a minute, caveat, editing, formatting, yeah. formatting is here. It depends on the complexity. Oh, you can book. totally do it. You could do formatting on your own. You'd have to buy InDesign or, or some other type of formatting I software, but you could this. learn that for sure. Yeah. But yeah, editing, you need to hire someone for sure. And Absolutely. And proofreading. Design. Yeah. <laughs> editing, cover design and proofreading are pretty much the, the, the places where I, I, I fall on the sword of saying these are must spend money on those types of things. But yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great point. I, I think that's, yeah. that's really true. You can easily spend, and it's, it's, a, it's interesting to me how many people are are terrified of learning marketing and, but you I'm won't screw you, it up. it's, it's, it's building relationships and it can be fun. And yeah. it can be, if you know who you're talking to and how to talk to them, that's so worth yeah. the time to figure that out. And then yeah. as you grow and as you're selling books and you can afford to bring in somebody to run your ads or do all the other things, then um, yeah, yeah, follow Michelle's Absolutely. Advice. Sure. All right, Angela, anything else? Now we are at 3.07, so we are going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, One disclaimer. I that feel I like Michelle said everything. I was like just enamored in my space. Like my, this is just perfect. <laughs> You guys, here's here's the last caveat that I want to give. We are three people who run three very different organizations. So what we've said now, not on the publishing, big picture publishing stuff. These are experts and I would trust, you know, that there's they, I do trust what's coming in. But when it comes to submissions, agent or no agent fees, the structure of the contract and all of that kind of stuff, please note this is going to vary from every single business. There is no one agent who operates the same as every other agent. There is no publisher who operates as every other publisher. So it's incumbent upon you, if that's the route you want to go, to do your research, find books that like yours and find out who's publishing them. Go find out information about their company. Go to their website, see what types of books they're publishing and if yours would be a good fit read their submission guidelines and follow them. They will tell you exactly what they want you to do and how to do it. And you do do it or you get put aside. So, you know, 
just know that, you know, that that's, it's incumbent upon you to do that. Use the publisher's marketplace, use the other places like that so that you can um, find out who's out there, but please spend the time researching the right agent for you and the right company for you. If you're doing that on the self-publishing side, please invest the time and energy to learn how to be a, a publisher, a, a public, pub, pub, a publishing professional, know and understand categories, genres, keywords, metadata, pricing, all those things. And the best part is if you want to self-publish and don't want to learn all of those things, there are wonderful self-publishing assist hybrid companies and other companies who can help you with that. But again, it's incumbent upon you to do the research and make sure that you're going with a good fit and understand what you're getting into. So um, I am so appreciative of the two of you taking time out and having this conversation. Angela and I can talk for hours. I know, hours. Michelle, you might have to come to Denver so. because her and I are going to go out and I put in that I'm speaking. I'm actually going to be doing like a four hour workshop, like full panel on Thursday on with a bunch of other experts. I'm just one of four experts to actually talk about how to create a book. Like a act, because sometimes I love y'all. But like the white pages, the missing pages, like what's a signature? So if you end up coming to IBPA and want to learn more about like all of that gritty, I mean, Lex is an expert and I just want to help, you know, you know, not get the two extra white pages in your children's book. That's, that's, that's yes. all, just talking about that. Yes. Awesome. That's so exciting. Um, okay. So you both have dropped your websites, but I want just for the sake of anybody who's driving or not, please repeat the names of your companies and um, where you want them to go to learn more about you. Okay. I'm really good at LinkedIn. Someone dropped my email. My email is so buried right now. It's probably the worst. So do what Alexa just said. I should have like gold stamped that recorded, put it out there. Go to my submissions page, you guys. It flows into Airtable. I have an acquisitions director. She's amazing. She, Elizabeth, she's like so A-type. She like checks it every day practically. And if she get a thing like, I mean, you're not going to get it every day. She'd kill me because there is something about four weeks. But <laughs> but the point is, is it's not going anywhere. And in the submissions, do a big favor. Say, I was here. I was at Women in Publishing. I was listening to Angela with Alexa and Michelle. Just write that little note for her. It is most likely going to get more eyeballs than putting it in my email. If you want to direct directly, though, everyone knows or some people I've seen, I'm actually really active on LinkedIn. DM me there. It's really easy. Um, and so I'll put that in the chat. Um, and also follow us on our socials. I'll write all that. Michelle, I like that follow you on the socials too, because, you know, maybe I can, maybe I should try to write. I do have an emphasis in creative writing. Maybe I should try to apply. I'm going to write a poem. <laughs> awesome. And, yep, it, and the I'm... collective book studio, the collective book studio is the name of her company. If you're looking on social media, to follow the collective yeah. book studio, not Angela's personal profile. So, okay. Michelle. I am Central Avenue Publishing. Um, <laughs> that's a tough one. You can't, I mean, emailing, I would say I'm kind of the same as Angela and like every person out there whose inbox is out of control. Um, I am not on LinkedIn. And I, I probably the best place to reach us is Instagram and TikTok, but they aren't always monitored by me directly because we have um, my assistant who does that. Um, I, I would say that if you're a poet who would like to dip their toe into traditional publishing, try out uh, the Central Avenue Poetry Prize submission um, and otherwise maybe just sign up for a newsletter and uh, you'll know when we are open for submissions again. So awesome. This has been a great discussion. I hope everybody learned something. Let me, did you, everybody who attended this, did you learn something new today? <laughs> And, you know, I'd be interested to knowing what in knowing what your biggest takeaway was from all of this. And again, just to reiterate, in case anyone thought that this was a like everybody has to traditionally publish or publish through Angela's company. That's not what we're saying. We're just giving education, although you're going to do real well if you published with these two <laughs> ladies. But, <laughs> um, you know, find the takeaway is there's many, many challenges for us in this industry there's many, many more opportunities and the more we can learn and the more that we can, um, you know, really put on our, our author and professional hats and get out there and do the work, the better we are going to 
be. So um, I just want to remind you, if you're attending this for, it, this was open to the public, if you don't have a ticket to the Women in Publishing Summit, please go over to womeninpublishingsummit.com and grab your tickets. One of the biggest areas of focus for us is yes, training and education and knowledge, but it's really about networking and about getting into small groups with publishers. We have a publisher speed dating so you can meet. And Michelle, if you want to be a part of that, I know Angela can't be there, but um, we can invite Michelle if she's available too. Like we have an opportunity for you to meet publishers. Um, there's an agent who's going to be at some of the sessions. We've got authors and and all the people that you need editors book marketers design people all the folks so that you can ask questions so that you can build your your community of people who can help and support you and have these types of conversations with and that is so 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 important is building those networks so that you can bounce ideas off of people learn together get resources and tools and all of those types of things and it's going to be the, put the link in there because I oh. put and, and then I'll also make sure to post it on my LinkedIn your your conference I do really highly recommend the conference I mean honestly I don't even know if Alexa does. I just was like, oh, women in publishing. I should just be a part of this because so I probably reached out to her to talk because I was like, I'm a woman in publishing. <laughs> um, so so I actually love this call, talk and your concept, Alexa. That's why I, I like I do think women lead differently. I just fundamentally you're leading, Alexa. Like the idea is that that we're not judging. We're not ever. I said that in the beginning. It's the why. And I think that women do a really good job at saying, can we have, look at you're having, I love the poetry and tea idea. I, I might, Michelle, say, could we come up with like a co-publishing, like on the spine deal where it's visual and tea and we, we put recipes on how to make tea. I mean, you've got my brain like a totally yes let's look at the content let's look at like how we can like put illustrations and teas and make tea bags and remedies or whatever with your book so what I think is I didn't even know you guys that I would want to talk with Michelle about a co-pub for her poetry and tea idea until we go. had this networking roundtable seminar and that's what you're going to get out of the women in publishing you're going to get your book your content your all your stuff just that much stronger and maybe even come up with another kind of concept for your story. Love it. I love it. It's it's in these groups, in these conversations where I learn the most, I grow the most. I mean, what I really love about um, women in the publishing uh, industry in general is how generous and giving of time and knowledge and just like, I mean, the time that we spend. Another reason for going to in-person events is you just, I mean, you can't replace that time that you can spend one-on-one -on -one with with a person or sitting around a table, having a couple drinks and laughing about everything that's happening and growing those relationships as Angela and I may or may have not done a couple of times. I don't know. <laughs> but, oh, and one other thing she mentioned, um, IBPA. So if you were curious about that in April in um, Denver- yeah. IBPA is having their publishing, their annual publishing university. It's a great conference. You can, you can just Google publishing university, IBPA publishing university and look at it. I their put it in the chat. I actually put it way up guys in the chat. So we were asking about networking and conferences. So that's the next up. That's not, I would love to go to Bologna, but I can also, Michelle have a, have a panel, but I can't afford to go this year, but I am going to this and it's in there and Alexa will be there. So if you do come, please email us, please tell me on LinkedIn, chat me like, you know, it's such a great place to just even grab an early cup of coffee. Uh, yeah, absolutely. To James comment, we do openly welcome men into our community yeah. as well. You just have to know that it's going to be lots and lots and lots of women, but the training and resources are wonderful. And I do want to share a little secret about Bologna. The only reason I was able to go to Bologna is because at the time I was in a relationship with a French guy. So I was able to like stay with him part of the time and... <laughs> He wasn't in Bologna, but he was in France. I flew into France. You know, I work, I work those things around it. But anyway, no, Bologna was an awesome experience. And um, anytime that you can save money to go to, there's London Book Fair. There's the um, uh, da, 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 Munich, uh, Frankfurt. Sorry, Frankfurt Book yeah. Fair. There's they're all over the world if you like to travel. Yeah. Um, at what what did we do? What did anything replace BEA? I mean, ALA is the there's gone. the U.S. Book Fair, I think it's called, and they are going to do it again this year, but it might be more trade focused. Uh -huh. um, so I would say 
for this audience, IBPA is awesome for absolutely yes. both this summit and IBPA. Oh my gosh, you'll get so much out of it. I think IBPA might have some virtual um, options as well. I was a member of IBPA for years and it was actually, I had bought a shelf <laughs> via IBPA and that's how I ended up at Book Expo. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend um, industry um, organizations. They do their conference uh, at different places around the country, Tammy. And last year it was in San Diego. And this year it's in Denver. The year before that yeah. it was in Florida. So they try to hit all the, you know, central, yeah. East Coast, West Coast. Um, but, well, thank you, James. That's amazing. We're, we're so happy to have you here with us. We, do, we don't have a lot of men, but we do love the ones who show up and, and hang out with us. So we're, we're happy. All to genders have welcome. Yes. So, okay. Well, this has been so much fun. And like I said, we could go on and on forever. Angela, I can't wait to see you in April. The rest of you, I hope you're grabbing your ticket and we'll see you um, March 6th through 9th, fully virtual. So if you can sign up to, if you can attend a Zoom room, you can participate. Everything will be recorded um, and all the recordings made available to all of our attendees. Speaking of recordings, uh, this one will be available as soon as it renders and downloads. I will upload it immediately to our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is under our mama company, which is Write, Publish, Sell. So please subscribe to us at youtube.com forward slash Write, Publish, Sell. All of our free webinars are there. Um, so you can go back and watch webinars to your heart's delight for years, <laughs> for years on there. Um Yes, there is a coupon code that's still available, Alexa 50, for people who don't have a ticket yet. And um, I'm I'm so excited to have had this time with all of you, especially, uh, you know, Michelle and Angela as the special guests. And uh, yes, I'm going to um, I'm going to run only because yes, I'm supposed to go into another to Zoom. <laughs> however, um, however, Alexa, I know I can't make next Saturday, March 6th, because I have an event, nice. but if there's another little time or ninth or whatever, but if there's another little time within your conference that you're doing something, just shot and shoot me a little email and I can make like a 30 minute coffee or tea break or networking room. If that would be helpful, just let me know. Happy to do it next week. Yes. Awesome. That'd be great. Yeah. Thanks. Just like, just send me a couple things and I'm happy. To, I'm happy everyone to be part of any part of any little thing. So hopefully I'll get to chat in a room. I'm just not available that Saturday. That sounds good. We'll invite you to the networking and people can chat with you. Okay, everyone. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.